Thank you very much, Tamash. It's um, it's great to be at least virtually here. Unfortunately, I guess um, no one um, could make it to Vienna in person. Um, this is um, a project that I've been involved in with a very large number of other people who are um, sort of um, the Rhodes Gallery is um, is up here. Um, right and um and so what this is about is about um measured um random circuits you've heard some talks about this topic so i'm going to keep my introduction very short so um in general when you talk about open quantum systems um what you mean is that you call some of your degrees of freedom the system and some of them the environment and you divide anything you do into unitaries that act only on the system and unitaries that cross this system environment um, boundary. Um, and, um, and so once you have this um, sort of very general description, you can do one of two things. You can either look at the environment. If you look at the environment, that collapses the wave function of the environment, and it also induces a collapse in the wave function of the system. And that's what's called a measurement. Um, and that, that makes sense if you think about your environment as a measuring apparatus. Um, the other perspective you could have is that you don't know what the environment is. It's something you have no control over. So you can't look at it. So you have to trace over it. And that gives you decoherence and it takes a pure state to a um, mixed state. And, um, and so in both of these cases, um, you can um, avoid explicitly referring to the state of the environment um, and you can um, sort of um, compress your description to in one case, a quantum trajectory and in the other case, a quantum channel. And of course, a quantum channel is a sum over quantum trajectories, um, over measurement records that you could have gotten if you had looked at the environment. Um, now, the thing I want to emphasize here is that when you um, trace over the environment to get the quantum channel, you're losing information. Um, and you're losing information specifically because um, there are many different um, ways of measuring the system that when you trace over them, give rise to the same quantum channels. There's a substantial degeneracy um, in, this, in, this, in this respect. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is things that happen in individual quantum trajectories um, that are not, um, that the quantum channel is uh, blind to. And, um, and so um, when I talk about something that happens in an individual quantum trajectory, what I mean is I take the wave function at the end of the trajectory, I, um, I normalize it, and I compute some quantity in that wave function. It could be an entanglement entropy, it could be a charge variance and expectation value, it could be any function of that wave function um, or of the mixed state if you had a mixed state. There's a distinction to be made here that's very important between linear functions and nonlinear functions. If you take a linear function, then what happens, oh yeah, and I should say that um, each, um, each trajectory is weighted by its probability of having occurred, and that's its born probability. Um, so um, when you look at um, um, a linear function, the born probability upstairs cancels it out, um, the normalization factors downstairs, and then what you end up with is your trajectory unraveling was completely optional. It doesn't matter which trajectory you unraveled into. Um, your expectation values depend only on the quantum channel. On the other hand, if you take a nonlinear function, anything is could be as simple as a variance. Um, it has this piece that's not a linear function. It's not just linear expectation value. And so it actually does care how you unravel the channel into trajectories. And, um, and so what's gotten, so historically, um, people have always thought about trajectories as just being an efficient way of numerically evaluating a quantum channel. And so that's, that's this linear case. But um, in the past few years, people have gotten interested in what happens um, in typical trajectories. And to study that, you look at um, nonlinear functions, like, for example, the purity of a quantum state or its entanglement entropy. And, um, and these things can undergo phase transitions even in cases when the quantum channel is completely trivial. And, um, and that's the cases we're going to talk about today. Um, and so the most studied example of this is this entanglement or purification phase transition. Um, and, um, and so um, it's between the case where if you take an initially unentangled state gets either highly entangled or not. If you take an initially a mixed state, the measurements either succeed in converting it into pure state by extracting all the information from it or not. Um, the perspective I like to take on this is um, the perspective originally proposed by Sun Won Choi, Ed Altman, and co-workers, 
And the perspective is as follows. Let's say you have Alice and Bob and Alice and Bob share some bell pairs. Uh, and then Alice, um, what she does is she um, um, scrambles um, her bell pairs with a bunch of other degrees of freedom. And then she tries to, um, and then she performs measurements on single qubits um, on her side of the system. And if, if the scrambling is efficient enough, um, you can show uh, more or less rigorously that, um, that um, Alice isn't going to collapse any bell pairs by making local measurements because now the bell pairs are encoded in these highly non-local um, degrees of freedom that Alice um, really has no local access to. And so that's the basic um, idea behind the existence of this mixed phase, this volume law phase, where, um, where measurements are unable to extract um, information about the system. And so the thing that allows this highly entangled phase to exist is, um, in this perspective, is um, scrambling. And so there are a couple of asterisks required to really make that sharp, but you can say that scrambling obviously has a lot to do with the stability of this phase where measurements are unable to extract information um, from the system. Um, and um, if you think scrambling is important, then a very natural question to ask is, um, what happens when you put in conservation laws rather hydrodynamic modes. Because hydrodynamic modes don't scramble the same way as generic degrees of freedom because their evolution, their scrambling is highly constrained by, um, by the conservation laws and symmetry is the problem. And so that's the question that we're going to address today. And we're going to address it using the simplest possible model with some hydrodynamics in it. And that's the model of, um, of a chain of, um, of, of qubits. And um, in general, I'm going to couple them to some um, q degrees of freedom on every, on every site. Um, and, um, and, so, um, and so each pair of qubits is going to um, undergo, it's, you know, you're going to have a brickwork type circuit and the gates um, that, that make up this brickwork type circuit have this block diagonal structure that comes from um, U1 conservation. Um, this is a model that's been studied extensively and it's um, tractable in the axis of measurements. It's been used to say a lot about um, how, um, how operator growth happens or how OTOX behave in the absence of, um, of measurements. We're going to put in measurements again in the dumbest possible way by measuring the charge, the local charge of a, um, of, of a qubit. Um, and that's to say you measure it in its computational basis. And, um, and so this allows for a step mech description when, um, when the qubits are high dimensional. And the step mech description is going to be valuable for many reasons. One of them is it allows us to write down a field theory and the details of that I'm not really going to talk about today because I don't have time. Um, but the other thing that's nice about it is you can, once you construct the stat mech model, you can study the stat mech model using conventional um, DMRG type methods. And because you're looking at a stat mech model and not the original circuit, um, you don't have to deal with the volume law. In fact, the stat mech model never gets, um, never gets a large amount of um, complexity. It can always be described using controlled bond dimension. Okay, and the main result that I'm going to talk about today is that now um, there's not only this phase transition between the entangling and the non-entangling phase, that's the volume law and the area law phase, but there's a new transition that lies inside the volume law phase, um, and we call that the sharpening transition, um, and it happens um, substantially before the, the entanglement transition. And, um, and so the, um, the basic picture behind the sharpening transition is not very hard to explain. Um, let me just write down the order parameter. The order parameter is you take an individual trajectory, you evolve it for a long time. If your system is of size L, you evolve your trajectory for a time of order L in order to reach a steady state. And um, once you reach a steady state, what you do is you measure the variance of, um, of the global charge in that trajectory in the steady state. And you can see that this exhibits a crossing um, where when the measurement rate is low enough, um, um, the, um, the variance remains finite and grows with system size. Um, whereas if the measurements happen faster than the critical rate, um, the uncertainty, the charge uncertainty goes down um, with system size. So what's happening is that the, that the measurements are either able to efficiently extract the total charge of the circuit quickly or they're not. So those are the two phases. The phase where measurements 
um, quickly sharpen the global charge. There's there's only one, and so once the global charge is sharpened, then can't it can change at all because now it's an eigenstate of both the measurements and the um, the evolution operator. Um, but the but there's another phase that's the fuzzy phase um, in my phase diagram where measurements um, take a long time to figure out what the global charge of the set of this of the system is. Um, okay. And um, and so there's a fairly simple argument um, that involves almost no quantum mechanics for what why uh, for what the the dynamics of charge should be um, in the limit of weak measurements. So in the limit where, where you're not measuring very much, you can assume um, very crudely, um, and I'll improve this next slide that um, that the charge is completely delocalizes through the system between measurements. And so in that case, what you're doing is what you is you're trying to estimate the global charge of a system by making um, sort of a bunch of local measurements, a bunch of independent local measurements of the charge density. And there's a very simple center limiting argument that tells you that um, that if you want to do that for a system with charge um, with charge n and or you know charge l uh, charge of order l. And um, and you want to get the charge down to an uncertainty less than one, then you need L squared measurements to do that. That just comes out of the central limit theorem. Um, how many measurements do you need? How long does it take to do L squared measurements? Well, you're doing um, you're measuring a fraction p of the sites at every time step. So that's PL times the number of time steps, um, and so that's PL times t. Um, you equate these two things, and you see that the, that the the amount of time you have to wait in order to sharpen the charge is um, is linear in, in, in L. Okay, that's what happens when the measurement rate is um, is sufficiently slow. And you'll notice that even in this uh, very weak measurement case, um, there's a drastic separation of scales between um, the time it takes to sharpen the charge and the time, for instance, it takes to extract all the quantum information from an initially mixed state, which is exponential. This is just linear and um, in, 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 in the circuit size. But it's still linear, so it grows with um, with circuit, it grows with the size of the system, which it doesn't do in the in, in the sharp phase. Okay, so um it turns out that this um, fuzzy phase um, is um, is interesting, not only in terms of its global charge dynamics, but also in terms of what happens locally. So let me walk you through a very quick heuristic treatment of how that works. Um, and, um, and so the first thing to notice is that if you take a block of your system of size L, um, it, it takes a time of order L um, by my previous argument to sharpen charge inside that block. And this is much less than the careless time, which it, you know, is what it takes for the charge to have diffused out of the block completely. So that says that um, that the charge sharpening is going to be an important aspect of the hydrodynamics um, of, of the system because it's a faster process um, than diffusion. And so you can include, um, and so you can include um, charge sharpening in the hydrodynamics of the system by looking at um, some quite natural observable like the um, like the static structure factor at late times, um, and notice that this is also something that's not a linear function of trajectories because this bit is linear, but this bit is a product of two things, and so it's not a linear function. So it's allowed again to be sensitive to single trajectory properties. Okay, and so roughly speaking, um, the um, CK is um, is basically the variance of the charge um, in a region of, of size one over K. Um, that's sort of the obvious um, Fourier transform relation between um, lengths and, um, and, and momenta. Okay, so um, before we talk about measurements, let me remind you very quickly of how um, hydrodynamics works um, in the absence of measurements um, for a quantity like this. So for a quantity like this, um, hydrodynamics consists of, um, of two pieces. The first is that um, fluctuations on the scale diffuse away and decay through diffusion on a uh, with a lifetime that's dk squared, right? Um, sorry, let me get back to... Um, yeah, so um, so there's this decay of, 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 of fluctuations, um, but of course, there's also this growth of fluctuations that comes from noise, that comes from the fact that, um, that you know, you have not only diffusion, but you have noise as things are randomly walking about the system. And you need both the diffusion and the noise 
um, to give you um, the steady state because the steady state has fluctuations in it and the diffusion and the noise are related by the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And the fluctuation dissipation theorem tells you that if I normalize a noise like this, the noise has to have variance of order one. And that gives you that, um, that the steady state um, has a constant CK that's independent of, of momentum at small momentum. That just corresponds to high temperature state with spatially uncorrelated fluctuations. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, this picture and I'm going to toss in um, measurements um, in the simplest possible way. And I say that, you know, the measurement, the sharpening time is, um, is L. Um, and so the rate at which measurements sharpen has to go as K, right? And, um, and so it's, you can immediately see by power counting that it's small K, um, the measurements completely dominate. Um, the, the, the diffusion. And so in effect, um, the, the dynamics of structure factor is set by balancing um, the noise, which increases variance against the measurements, which reduce variance. And the steady state here, you can see by one line calculation um, has, um, has, um, has CK going as modulus of K. And so when you convert that into, um, into more familiar quantities, you find, for example, that the, um, the connected correlation function between two points is algebraically decaying um, with the decay rate one over X squared. And, um, and also if you take a block the system of size L, um, the charge variance inside that block um, goes logarithmically in L. And these properties check out very well um, against um, numerical evaluation in the step make model. So, um, so, this, so this, this basic perspective does seem to be on the right track. Okay, so that's um, as much as we can say on general hydrodynamic grounds. And it's very suggestive because um, both these features, both logarithmic growth of entanglement, um, sorry, both logarithmic um, dependence of number variance and, um, and the um, the, the correlation function of the hydrodynamic quantity are exactly what you'd find in a Luttinger liquid. On the other hand, uh, you can also see that the, state, the system is not just in a Luttinger liquid state because first of all, the overall state is volume though entangled. And second, um, if you measure something that would give you the continuously varying exponent in Luttinger liquid, which is um, something like this plus minus correlator, um, you can see immediately that this, the, the first, the, connect, the connected or the um, the the left hand side the the sort of um, the the um, the two point part of it is trivial because just given by the quantum channel um, the non trivial part of it um, um, is um, identically zero by U one symmetry because these objects are zero in a globally charged sharp state so, so these non hydrodynamic correlations don't see um, the transition they don't see the parallel correlations at all so it's a weird kind of Luttinger liquid like state where um, no natural physical observable is able to see these, um, these um, power law um, correlators. Okay, so, um, so it turns out that if you, um, that there is a clever duality trick that allows you to find an object with power law correlators and that's um, the string order parameter, which again is um, a little too much um, detail for me to go into. But, um, but the key thing is that if you, if you get these continuously varying power laws from the string order parameter, or equivalently, if you take the coefficient of the logarithm in the charge variance seriously, um, you, can, you can try and say, okay, here's a Luttinger liquid, um, and, um, and what kind of transitions can a Luttinger liquid undergo? The only natural thing to have happen is a costless tailless transition. And so we'd like to figure out what a costless, where the costless tailless transition is and what's causing it. And, um, and so to do that, we need to do a considerable amount more work. And, um, and that's um, something I'm gonna talk very briefly about now. And, that's, um, and so to do that, I need to explain how this, um, how this um, step make model um, works. So I'm not going to go into the derivation. The step make model involves doing a bunch of um, a bunch of traces over um, um, complicated um, sort of permutation group objects. But um, the place you end up is very simple, and in some ways, it's the thing you could have guessed the non-logically. So you end up with a classical model um, that describes an ensemble of um, of random walkers. The random walkers um, repel each other, 
so they're um the hardcore um and um and the subjects are constrained but um at every measurement site so the measurement sites in this picture are darts um so either the dot in this in this directory either the dart is, is filled in which case some walker has to go through the dart um or um the walker is um is 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 empty in which case um nothing is allowed to go through um through that um through that dot so so these are sites where you did a measurement and you saw nothing these are sites where you did a measurement and saw something and um you have an you have an ensemble of random walkers um and these this ensemble of random walkers has got to agree um it, it, it's it's got to agree on on what happens at each of these um sites and um and so you can think about you can reformulate this as a replica field theory um where very heuristically um you can think about these different histories as different you know these different members of the ensemble as um as uh, being um different um trajectory different um different parts the parts of the path integral corresponding to given trajectory and um and so what you're asking is um is once you introduce all these pinning sites um are the replicas glued together are all these trajectories glued together are they forced to agree are they forced to sort of always agree on where the polymers are pointing or can you have a fair amount of floppiness in terms of um in terms of these um in terms of where these walkers are pointing so this gives you two phases and you know, think about it as a phase where um the blue um the the blue lines are locked to the to the red lines and a phase where the where they're not and and so um and so one of these can be thought about as a superfluid and the other one can be thought about as a um as as an insulator in the insulator um different trajectories are perfectly locked to each other and so um and so basically what that means is that the measurements you performed are sufficient um to fix uh to small up to small fluctuations the local charge everywhere um whereas um in um in the other phase um you can have what's happening in this picture where you know this region has um three charge has charged three in some histories and charged two in other histories and the measurements are just not plentiful enough to um to distinguish those two things locally and um and so um the transition can be thought to happen via the proliferation of face slips um, and if you think about um, about these blue and red lines as lines of of constant phase, um, that's that sort of there's a phase slip here between in the interreplica um, phase, and so that 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 that's you can think about that as as a phase slip or a vortex, and that's that's what drives the transition. And from this perspective, um, you can um, if you um, set things up. Carefully, you can estimate um, by standard cost of seller theory at what value of the measurement rate the phase transition should happen. And in fact, um, this um, the the location of the phase transition that you get out of this um, out of this estimate is not so far from the location of the crossing in the variance, and so everything hangs together. The phase transition extract from various from two different methods: the variance and this dual um this this dual um order parameter look the same um and um and so we generally end up with this uh picture where the sharpening transition happens at a measurement probability of 0.2 which is much which is very deep inside the volume law phase so it sort of really is totally disconnected from the entanglement transition in um in this large d step mech limit you can also ask um, whether the sharpening transition remains separate from the entanglement transition um, for a model that just has, you know, qubits um, subject to a random U1 conserving circuit. And um, this is something that Jed Pixley and his group at Rutgers looked at um, numerically. And um, the evidence here is not so clear cut, but you can see that um, that if you collapse um, the sharpening transition and the entanglement transition, they do seem to be at least um, somewhat distinct. Um, the um, the confidence intervals are like at least somewhat non-overlapping. So there's um, so it's at least suggestive that these are different transitions, um, all the way down to um, to the case of um, of individual of just um, qubits with no qubits. 
Okay, um, one final thing that I wanted to say about this is, um, so um, if you try and look at the space-time scaling at the Shatning transition or the entanglement transition in these circuits, you find that, um, that they both obey Z equals one dynamical scaling, so space and time scale isotropically. This should surprise you a little at first sight because um, in a system with a conservation law and conventional hydrodynamics, um, you do have um, diffusion, right? I mean, um, so charge moves diffusively in the circuit. And so you might say, well, how do you have, um, how do you have Z equals one dynamical scale in coexisting with diffusion? Um, from the field theory perspective, what seems to happen is this interesting decoupling between um, the Z equals two replica average mode and Z equals one mode that governs fluctuations between, um, between replicas. Um, that's that's a bit um, non-intuitive, but um, at least for the case of um, entanglement dynamics, there's a um, there's there's a much sharper issue, which is that it's known that without measurements, um, without measurements, Renyi entropies um, for Renyi index greater than one um, grow diffusively in time. Um, and a somewhat surprising finding that we had was that once you put in any density of measurements. Um, the Rennie entropies actually grow ballistically. So the measurements actually enhance the growth of the higher Rennie entropies. Um, and, um, and so this, this basically has to do with the fact that, um, that um, when, you're, um, when you have no measurements, then the, the, these um, big dead regions um, where you, know, you have a bunch of upspins next to each other, um, and these red regions have some amplitude in every trajectory because all trajectories are the same. And so they, they infect entanglement in every trajectory. Whereas um, once you start measuring the circuit, you're like, aha, this region is dead or it's not dead. And so that means that, um, that, the, that the dead regions only exist in red trajectories. And so um, somewhat counterintuitively, um, I haven't really got time to uh, go into this, but I can talk about it more in questions if people care. Uh, measurements restore the ballistic growth of Rennie entropies, and they sort of, and so the diffusive, um, the diffusive um, charge dynamics decouples totally from the dynamics of entanglement or even the dynamics of um, of, of these um, charge fluctuations, um, and so that gives you these um, the z equals one scaling at both transitions. Uh, it's not clear if this exists in higher dimensions. In higher dimensions, the possibility that the z equals two mode recouples, and we speculate on that a bit um, in our paper. Um, okay, so that's um, I think um, most of what I wanted to say today. So to summarize, there's this. Um, we looked at, um, at at random circuits with this one conservation law. Um, and even in circuits, even putting in this one conservation law gives you a um, gives you a new phase transition that happens inside the volume law phase, and so you have these two regimes inside the volume law phase. In one of them, um, there's a lot of entanglement, but the charge is more or less completely frozen. In the other one, the charge is fluctuating, but it's fluctuating a lot less. So charge variance is parametrically lower than it would be in the absence of measurements. Without measurements, the charge variance inside a region of size L would scale linearly in L. The moment you put in any measurements at all, that, that linear in L gets collapsed down to log L. Um, and, um, and so there's a, there's a cost of the cellless transition between um, these two regimes. Um, and so there's this interesting new, um, there's interesting new hydrodynamics that comes about it's not a hydrodynamics of charge, it's hydrodynamics of fluctuations of charge in the presence of, um, of measurements as well as charge spreading. And, um, and so you can study this thing in some amount of detail using um, the stat mech mapping and the fact that um, the stat mech model um, is no longer the circuit dynamics. So the volume law phase in the circuit turns out to just be a ferromagnetic phase in the stat mech model. So it's not that highly entangled and you can deal with it um, using DMRG. And, um, and so that allows you to do very controlled and um, scalable numerics. Um, and, um, and yeah, so, so in one dimension, you have a cost of the cellless sharpening transition. Um, and, um, and so um, the question of what happens in higher dimensions is something that's a bit open and, um, and that we're still working on. And um, another thing that naturally is raised by this discussion is what happens if you have symmetries 
that are more interesting than year one, like multiple year ones or, you know, SU2 or anything else like that. So, so those things remain largely open. And, um, and so there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff to, that we still need, that still remains to be learned about these systems. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention.